another episode of the show. It is episode number 300, and it's April 22nd, 2022. I'm joined once again by Kyle Klingman, and uh, show number 300, it, it's uh, a big guess for this one, I would say, Kyle. It is a big guess, man. What a great flow film. You guys do such a great job with those flow films. It's unbelievable. It's what the, the calling card is, I think, for flow wrestling in a lot of ways, so I'm glad that I was able to watch it last week. Powerful film, and glad we get the the guest of the film on this show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I real quick, Kyle, I want to, you're, you're like a wrestling historian. Give me your, your one minute take on, on, on Gregor as a wrestler. Intense and really kind of broke new territory because when you think about that with Dustin Schlater in 06, he had the, uh, the best true freshman year, what I think of all time in college wrestling. And then to go next year and to be able to kind of crack the code and, win that semifinal match that was a, a pretty big deal so consistency wrestled in probably the toughest era of 149 to think about that and and to come through with seven or excuse me four all-american honors that's a, a big deal and come over with an ncaa championship you're talking about rarefied air there man gregor gillespie's good yeah let's bring him on gregor gillespie uh, welcome to the show man thanks for joining us hey guys yeah so that was uh it's super funny that you bring that match up. I was actually speaking to a dad of a kid that I uh, help out. And he was like, man, I watched that match against, he, he called him the Minnesota guy. He's like, he did, you know, this is 15 years ago. I guess it, yeah, it was 15 years ago. And like, yeah, I'm not super relevant anymore. Dustin Schlater I, at the time I was trying to explain to him was like, you know how Yanni was his freshman year. That, that was Dustin. Like everyone, Yanni, Yanni. And I love Yanni and Yanni is incredible, but that's what Dustin Schlater was then. I think I, I, he was undefeated that year. I think he'd only lost one match his true freshman year. I think he lost to DeSalvo from central Michigan. He goes on to beat guys. Like I think he beat used uh, Eustace. He beat Esposito a couple of times. He was just a killer and he was 18, maybe 19 years old, you know, a true freshman. And uh, I remember that whole year coach Flynn just kept telling me, he's like, you're the guy. You're the guy. You're gonna knock off Shader. He's like, you know why? And I said, why? He goes, look at how many how many points he scores a match. He's like, all you have to do is score more than three points. He wins three to one, three to zero, three to two. You know, every time he's like, yeah, you're gonna score. You just score more points than that. And I was like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> and um, he was just, yeah. I mean, but I was trying to explain to that that dad how good Dustin Schlater really was back then, and it was such an incredible thing to be a a part of that weight class in that era and uh, I, I think you guys did that flow film kind of segue into the the flow films here why if we yeah. you know what way to do it and then the 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 bracket right when you guys did that show the what was it the bracket was it that's what it was called last yeah, year. The yeah that was time. one year after yeah that was one year after i won that weight class it was then the following year was schlater metcalf caldwell Terrell, you know palmer the list goes on jp o'connor but like People don't realize a lot of those guys were in my weight that year. Like when I beat Schlater, I think Schlater the round before that had beaten Burroughs, you know, like it was just a solid of a weight class. So, you know, should do another flow film called the, the second best bracket. <laughs> was that the year before? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the year after in 08, I think it was, it was not even close. It was yeah. an insane bracket, in but um, yeah. Cracking the code with Dustin Schlater. You got, you figure out how to take him down, you could probably beat him, right? When did you, you know, Flynn's telling you, you're the guy. All you got to do is score through. You're the guy. I think you were yeah. seventh the year before, which is good, but, like, Schlater was on, on a whole other thing. When did you actually believe, like, I, I can do this? Or I'm, maybe I'm going to do it. I remember two things, like, super distinctly that Coach Flynn said to me. Now, obviously, you know Coach Flynn, and you know how he can, like, you know, he has a way with words, but a lot of times the things he says are funny, and they're not meant to be funny. It's just the way his mannerisms, <laughs> the way he says things. And I remember two times that year, and obviously these both were jokes. So I want to just preface this by saying these are not serious things that Flynn was saying. And again, obviously this was, yeah, I guess it was 06, summer of 06. So, I mean, it was a long time ago, you know, over a decade ago. So we didn't have the same cell phone technology and you used house phones a little more. I was home in the summer between freshman year and, and sophomore year, whatever, a couple of weeks, just a 
short visit home and I got a call. My, I, was, I was out playing badminton in the backyard with my brother and my dad comes out of the garage. He says, hey, Coach Flynn's on the phone. I said, oh, great. So I walk into the garage. I pick up the phone. He goes, I, this is, I feel like corny even doing this. But he was pretending to be Dustin Schrader. He's like, ah, this is Dustin Schrader. I just did 300 pull-ups. What are you doing? And he was like kind of like messing with me. And he's like, ah, you better go do 400 or something. And that was one thing I remember. He always like teased me with stuff like that. And then the other thing I remember him saying, because everyone was so high on Dustin Schrader, as, as they should have been. He was a true freshman national champ. I think when people think about that, they forget to understand that that means he won a national title less than a year removed from high school. He graduated high school in June or July and in March. So we're talking nine months. He won an NCAA title. Like that's, it's insane. So like people were really high on him. Coach Flynn was like sick of it. I think he said something one day. He was like, I'm so sick of hearing about this guy. He's like, right, you're going to be the guy. You're going to be the guy. And like, we were kind of like slated to meet at the Southern Scuffle that year. Okay. So like, we didn't know that Jordan and Liam was going to be in that mix. We hadn't really like accounted for him yet. We knew he was good, obviously. But like when we were looking at the brackets and what teams were there, the Southern Scuffle that year, I thought we were going to, you know, at some point run into Schlater and Flynn again, this is a joke. So, you know, don't think this is actual (laughs) coaching advice from Flynn, but he's like, I'm so sick of hearing about this guy. Gregor, when you walk out there, I want you to walk out, shake hands. Don't even get in your stance. Just fucking punch him in the face. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I want you to let him know there's someone else at the weight class. Let him know that no one, like there's, there's going to be a guy that's not going to put him on a pedestal. That guy is you. And obviously that was like a metaphor. It wasn't, Hey, I think you muted yourself, Gregor. I think you might have muted yourself on accident. Gregor, can you hear me? I don't know if he can hear me. This is great stuff. Oh, yep. Sorry. I, uh, someone <laughs> called me. I think it muted. Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so Are Coach told you to punch oh, him in the hold face. On, hold on here. Wait, hold on. No problem. Okay. I'm sorry. Someone called me, and I think it muted me. Are we, we good? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're good. You okay. were talking, Coach Flynn told you to punch yeah. him in the face. Coach it wasn't a real metaphor. There, shake hands, punch him in the face. And obviously that was a joke and a metaphor for, you know, let him know that there's someone else at the weight class that you, you're not going to put him on a pedestal. You're not going to just roll over for him, you know, and, and they, there's, you're here to compete. You know, you're going to have if you're going to win, you're going to have to fight, you're going to have to fight for it, you know. And uh, obviously I lost to Jordan Lean that year at the scuffle. Uh, that's why I didn't get to wrestle Schlater. But, you know, I, do, I don't know why. I had a confidence that I didn't think Schlater was unbeatable. And I don't know if it was me being young and naive and just unaware of how good he really was and how, you know, and I really don't have a problem saying this. I'm, you know, quite a bit older now and a bit more mature, but I don't think that I was as good technically speaking as Dustin Schlater was that year or, you know, at at any point during college, but there's so much more that goes into winning than the better guy. You know, who competes better? That's a skill. Uh, you know, as someone banged up, that's something that longevity is a thing in this sport. You know, it's a long season. Who can stay healthy the longest? Who made weight the right way? So many more things, you know, uh, who, who can read the referee better? So, like, you know, a lot of people watch that match and they talk about how you oh, you backed up so much, man. You know, that you would have lost that match. If, I, I know the rules were different back then. You have to have an ability to read the referee. If he's letting you do something, you do it as long as you can before you get penalized for it, you know. And against a guy like Dustin Schrader, you, you guys remember how he wrestled. If you pressured back into him, you were going to get ducked. You were going to get shrugged. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, you had to, you know, the, I, I thought strategically speaking – you know, that was one that was like a masterpiece beating a guy that, you know, literally was thought to be unbeatable, you know. Did you guys, did you like do that uh, prep? Like, hey, uh, don't, you know, maybe, maybe back up a little bit, right? Or don't, don't be overly aggressive. Were there, was there focus throughout the year or as it led up to NCAAs on how to wrestle this guy specifically should you meet? No, I think there was more of a very general, vague, um, uh, suggestion from Coach Flynn: Don't push into him. You know, get him to follow you a little bit. Maybe fake touch to get his hands come up. Because you know, Schlater defensively was about as sound as they come. Uh, he keeps his hands in front of his legs. He doesn't overreact to fakes. 
you know, kind of draw him in, get his hands to come up and shoot hard. And, you know, that was kind of the game plan. But that, I think there's just a general uh, suggestion from Coach Flynn, don't push into him. You know, stay out of stay out of tie ups where your hands are in the same spot for very excuse me for very long. You know, but I think one thing that Coach Flynn really, really did a great job of instilling in me uh, from day one was like, don't, don't don't focus on the other guy. Don't worry about what he's doing so much. Picture what you're doing. You know, and I remember one time it was actually before that. This is actually I don't think I've ever even mentioned this to anyone anymore. Not that it's you know anything bad, but. uh it was probably two weeks, maybe within a week. I don't know. It was somewhere leading up to that nationals that I won. And coach Flynn told me he wanted me to go in the the lounge, like our athlete lounge. I mean, it's just a couple couches and a TV or whatever back then. And he's like, go in there. And I want you to pull up three or four matches. Ones where you won. Ones where you thought you really wrestled well. Ones where, you know, you were in a really good low stance and you were shooting well and you were running up to your feet on your finishes. Watch those matches. So he had me watch, you know, three or four matches where I wrestled really well. And that's something that I think is super important. I don't I don't think it's necessarily that great to watch the guy that you're going to compete against and start picturing what they're great at. You start to forget about what you do great. And I, I told a kid last night that I was helping out because he got, you know, he's out at the war at the shore or whatever last week. He's watching a kid that he was wrestling on. Whoa. I was like, dude, stop that, man. Don't do that. You know who you should be watching? You. you go pick a match where you ducked the kid under five times and made him fall on his face and held his head down when you let him up. Go watch that. Remember how good you are, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Long answer for that, but no, oh, that's awesome. That's, that was fascinating to hear all that, all that backstory and, and your perspective on that. Another thing, um, and I do want to get to fight of your life, but I, I now with the Ron wrestling, I want to talk a little bit more. I didn't remember till we made this film that you won in the finals in overtime and were almost dead to rights. It was like a defensive scramble. Uh, right, you were you were kind of beating the position, but you you wiggled your I way mean, out of it. But I couldn't imagine being more taken down without it being a takedown. And again, I have no, I, I I'm not gonna, you know, I don't have to sit here and defend a position. I won the match. They can't take it back. I definitely think. Under different circumstances, had it been a Big Ten referee, had it been now, because I think they give it less reaction time now. I mean, that today, right now, I'm sure, that's probably a takedown. You know, he had both of my legs. Uh, fortunately for me, I, I don't really know what you even call that position, but I'm pretty good out of that position where if someone has two of your legs and you whizzer to your hip and come up on a knee, uh, so you're not on your butt. If you stay on your butt, it's takedown, you know. Uh, but, yeah, he did have two of my legs, and I was on my butt for, you know, flash in the pan and got up, and I, I put him into a crackdown position where I think I'm probably one of the hardest guys in history to score on from that position. And, you know, the rest is history. <laughs> You're a freak, yeah. man. It was it was wild. It was wild. It was it was a nice refresher because you go to all these these NCAA's and you can't remember every oh, single God. finals or match or whatever. But yeah, that that was a good one. Um, okay, segue from the the bracket, the greatest bracket, right? Segue and flow films, which you started five minutes ago. Um, so first of all, I guess just just your initial reaction after you watched this film. I assumed you watched it. I have, yeah, several times. Um, I, I got to start by saying, man, I, I, you guys are about as great as they come with doing documentary stuff and films and flow, whatever you call them, flow films, documentary, mini series, docu series, whatever. You guys, and I mentioned this to Kyle Sermonero, my best friend. You probably remember him, you know, yeah. wrestler from back in the day, but he's, he's like my brother, my best friend, and he had watched it. And we were talking about all the great flow films over the years. And I said, dude, there is absolutely no difference in the quality of video that if you watch like a Netflix original or a flow film, they're as well put together as anything out there. It is a professional film. It is not something that some guy did with a handheld camera. It's unbelievable how good the flow films really are and the editing and the music and the way things flow into each other. And then I obviously knew my parts and what I had said. Obviously, it was a while back that we filmed. I, I remember my parts and I, I remember my, it's my story. So my parts aren't going to necessarily make me get emotional but i'll tell you what man there were some parts in there that had me that had the the water flowing man it was there were a couple parts and uh obviously the the couple people talking about the, the siblings and family members that they had lost but i'll tell you what the parts when coach Flynn was talking man i it was it was tough for me to uh, 
tough for me, not in a bad way, in a good way, you know, and I texted coach Flynn after, and I have no problem at this point in my life, telling people that I love them and telling them that I appreciate them for the things that they've done for me. And, you know, telling someone that I don't take what they've done for me for granted. So the second that thing, uh, that film got done, I was actually finishing it. This is, uh, this is kind of how, when I was watching it at my house, I, you know, finishing the time I got in my car, I got to the gym and I was sitting there before I was training a couple of guys and I put it up on the phone holder in my car and I watched the last few minutes in the part where coach Flynn goes, um, the guy was like, get Gregor. We had a guy that did place four times and did win a national title. And when I see him now and he's doing all these things correct as a professional athlete, he's like, who knows what we would have had. And the guy goes, he could have been special. And coach Flynn, you know, he said he, he was special, man. And it was like, I don't know, man, there's just something about the way that coach Flynn talks about me. It just got me freaking really teared up. And I immediately texted Flynn after that. And I told him, you know, I didn't know what you were going to say. I knew that they'd interviewed you. Um, And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to remember sometimes like, you got people out there that really fucking care about you, man. And it's like, don't take that for granted. And I wanted to let coach Flynn know that after watching that film. And I texted him, I actually called him. I think he was busy. So I shot him a text. And then later that night, I got on the phone with him and Tanya, his wife. And I talked to them for, you know, well over an hour. And I just wanted to let them know that, you know, thanks for having my back. And, you know, that's something that I, I definitely don't take for granted. And, you know, it, it's, not really cliche to say this, man, that, that him telling me that I needed to go into rehab that day probably saved my life. And who knows if I'd be sitting here, if that weren't, you know, the way things transpired. So, yeah. Pretty awesome. The, the relationships you build with, you know, co- college coaches, right. Um, or co- probably coaches of any sport in any, any yeah. level, but when you can really connect the way that you did, and I have connections with my coaches and I'm sure Kyle and it's, it's just everybody does. So that, that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, when I first reached out to you and said, Hey, we're, you know, I kind of know like a little bit about your story. I don't know any details, but I think there's some, would, you know, would you be interested in like doing a thing with us? What did you think? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm super open about my story. Um, anyone who's not is probably if, if, if they have a story that has, and there's no happy ending obviously, because like, you're not a, you're in sobriety, you're not recovered, you're in recovery, you know, so I don't want to say it has a happy ending, things are going well. So if you don't tell that story, you're probably doing a disservice to people that need your help, you know, and uh, that's something that I was told very early on is pass it on, man. And like, you keep how your good sobriety and your good uh, mental health by by helping people. And um well, shit, man, I'd be lying if I said that I I didn't want to have a be involved in a flow film. I mean, that's got to be part of it, too, man. That's super cool. And what an honor that would be. Uh, so th- that was some of the things that were going through my head when you first contacted me. But I think more than anything, uh, this should exemplify right here why I-, I was interested in doing it. I can't even count how many messages from people that I'm close with from acquaintances, from strangers, from random accounts on Instagram, uh, saying essentially this, that was the most important film Flo has ever done. You're going to help someone with that message. And uh, I give the same response back every time. And it's, I hope it helps someone. I can't imagine that it, it wouldn't. And I hope it's exactly what someone needs to hear right now. You know, and, and it's, it'd be, I think it'd be silly for me not to tell my story and I've always been open about it. So it's not like I'm, Hey, coming out of and telling people for the first time, you know? Yeah. So, so so, so to that point, like some, sometimes we've done films with people and it is kind of, and maybe it's not the gravity of, of this one, but it's, it's just struggles within their life. And they're like, this is the first time I've ever done this. And then it's kind of felt therapeutic or like to that to a degree, was it like that at all with you or, or not so much because you had been so open about it? Well, no, sure. Anytime you talk about it, it's going to bring you back to some of those situations, right? So, um, you know, even when I was on the phone with Coach Flynn a couple of weeks ago, when I was talking to him about it, and we were talking about that night when I called him or he called me, I can't recall, and I was crying on the phone and he said, you know, you, you call them right now, son. It's like, tell them you need to come in. You need some help, man. And it's like, I can 
fucking smell the smell of that garage that I was in when I, you know, talked to, talked about that story. And it's like, it certainly is therapeutic. I think anytime you talk about something like that, um, it reminds you where you were. And uh, one thing that um, my, my sponsor who's near and dear to my heart said to me from, uh, from day one was uh, don't forget how bad it was, you know? So keep that. It's got that part has to stay fresh. Don't let that part uh, kind of escape your memory. You remember how bad it was, you know. Yeah. So I think telling the story is important, you know, because when you do that, hey man, holy shit, that was that was pretty crazy the way that I was living, man. And like, man, what a chaotic nightmare full of just insanity, you know. Yeah. So I think that is therapeutic would be the right word. Yeah. Okay. Um. Did you learn anything in general or about yourself through this process? Either whether whether it was the the day, days we spent with you in the interview, or since it came out and the the response that you've gotten. Um. Well, I guess you know, and I remember we had spoke. Um, you know, after we filmed, and you guys were deciding the direction of the film that you wanted to go. If you wanted to do another high level athlete, if you're going to do another athlete from another sport, if, and then obviously, <laughs> excuse me, you went with uh, the direction of a team or, you know, that area where those guys were from down there. And man, I thought that was such a genius move. And some people had said to me like, what the hell, man, what was that? They have you. And then they have some guys. I didn't really know who they were. I was like, no, 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 you're missing the point. The point of it was that it touches everybody. You know, it's like yeah. you've got a guy who's a top 10 guy in the UFC who won the Division One Nationals, and it can happen to him. And then you've got a dad of a kid who, you know, a, a city cop. And then you've got a wrestling coach who's lost 17 guys in, in, in a little town in New Jersey I've never heard of. And they had, you know, 70 – it's like, yeah, man, it's everywhere. So I think uh, – Oh, and I want to make sure that I say this before I forget when you said uh, if I had any reservations about doing this, if I was excited about doing it. Um, no, and I, I never once thought about not doing it. Um, and if anyone, the only reason to not do something like this would be fear of being judged, right? Like, how, oh, well, man, people might think poorly of me because I was, you know, at one point I was a drug addict and I was an alcoholic and I had these issues going on. Be very careful when you start judging people like that, because it can literally grab anybody, you know? So that same judgmental person that's doing something, you know, pointing the finger and, you know, making accusations or judgments on someone, it might be your kid one day and you might need someone like myself or my sponsor or some of my friends in the program to help someone you love. So remember that, that, that right there is why I had no reservations about doing it. Sure. Um, Man, I knew, I remember this from from spending time with you, and it's it's like right back again. Your energy is infectious, like like you are just like you. on a freaking ten out of ten. And I've, you've been told this before. I can't I can't yeah, be the first oh, person. Yeah, I got a motor. Why don't you ever stop moving? You know, my my, my jujitsu coach and I went up and climbed the mountain a couple of weeks ago, and he's like, Jesus, dude, do you ever stop moving? And I said, Why do you think I'm so lean? I'm shredded because I never stop moving. Never. <laughs> Um, that's a great I segue. Really, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. No, I was just kidding, Ron. I said I eat really clean, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Steak and asparagus yeah. or burnt broccoli. Yeah. Yep, yep. You're a very regimented guy, too. I learned that. You, you do the same things every day. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that, that's that's just an ad addictive personality kind of thing. You know, if you, have a, if you are someone who is prone to being uh, overly indulgent in things, you need your crosshairs aimed in the perfect direction. So if your crosshairs are aimed on drugs and booze and, you know, going and doing bad things, you're going to be fucking full bore, full steam ahead at those things. If they're aimed in the right direction, sure. Do I probably overtrain sometimes and get a little neurotic about the foods I'm eating? How? Yes. But I'd much rather have that problem, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned you, you got, you know, I think you were your jujitsu jiu coach. You took and climbing mountains. I wanted to talk about this anyways, like. Explain to me, and we'll, we can talk about fishing too, which I know is one of your passions. But climbing mountains, it's not, it's not like pitch and rope and and like climb. The is it? It's like hiking. And, okay, so and, like yeah, so I hate saying hiking because like when I <laughs> my jujitsu coach is one tough dude, like super tough. Like 
he like fucks me up. Like he's super tough. Yeah. Can I swear on this? Sorry if yeah, I go been, ahead. It's the that, internet. All right, cool. Yeah, he like fucks me up. Bad. He's a tough, tough dude, and he's been like busting my chops. He's like, man, uh, yeah, I'll climb him out. I'll. He's like, and I have the record on that app Strava for running up and summoning one of these four thousand foot peaks in the Catskills. And he's like, ah, I'm gonna blow your record. I'm like, okay, man, we'll see. So we go up there, dude, and like I knew this was gonna happen. I, I've taken a lot of people climbing, dude. If you're not in, in climbing shape, it's tiring. It's not. This is rock climbing when you're rappelling with ropes and carabiner. It's not what we're doing. We're going up a very steep trail. So essentially it is hiking, but like you do need some gear. So when we got up above 3,500 feet, it was sheer ice. So you need some spikes uh, and and, in, in the dead of winter, you need snowshoes, you need ski goggles, you need base layer, you need uh, insulated boots, you need ski goggles, you need crampons, maybe an ice ax here or there. So like, yeah, it's not just hiking. Um, I have two Garmin GPS satellite messengers that I pay for on like a monthly phone plan with. We're very serious about this my girlfriend got me into it and like obviously you know one or 100 i'm full steam ahead and i'm like dude when i realized how amazing and how fun this was i was like oh my god i don't know if i'm ever gonna fish again and <laughs> i i have a few times but man it's it's tough if i have a choice between the mountains or a fish i'm, I'm going to the mountains but anyways back to my coach i look back we're maybe a quarter mile under the climb he's back there with his hands on his knees bent over his face is white <laughs> And I'm like, hey, what's happening, man? And uh, he, he apologized. He literally said, you know, he's busting chops originally, but he said, he's like, yo, man, I take back everything I said. I take back everything I said about that. So, um, but for just for like a reference for people out there who don't know kind of some of the conditions that we hike in and like my girlfriend is about as tough as they come. Uh, we hiked one day this winter. Uh, I guess it would be in February. Yeah, it must have been February, January or February. And we were up in up north, really, you know, up in the mountains in the Adirondacks, which is northern New York, up, um, you know, right under Canada. And uh, we went out at five in the morning, and we did a twenty-one miler. I think it was fifteen hours. We did two peaks, which were about five thousand feet apiece, and um, it was negative thirty. What? And, yeah, it's negative 30, but that was at base elevation, and that was not accounting for wind chill. In, yeah, that was in the parking lot of the trailhead. So that's at maybe, two, I don't know, maybe 1,500 feet. So now we're going up another 3,000 feet. And on top of that, we're in a parking lot where there's trees around. There's no wind. I, I can't imagine how cold it was. I mean, there was a point, and I swear to God, there was a point on the way back where we had – like seven miles to go. When we start in the pitch black and we finish in the pitch black, we got headlamps on and there was me, my buddy, Joe Ordway, uh, and, and my girlfriend, obviously, and Joe's going to be, he's like, I think he's at the Academy to be a forest ranger in New York state right now. So he's a real deal outdoorsman. We were all like, you know, conversational and having a great time for the first 10 hours, the last seven miles, it was pitch black. Not, not any of us were saying a word, we're just marching forward. Every step was the worst step of my entire life. And like, <laughs> what do you do? Do you say, fuck this, I'm going home, I'm done. That's what you're already doing. You're already <laughs> going home. So yeah. the only option you have is to just keep going forward. You, the, I, I have satellite messengers. Dude, you, to get rescued where we were, I mean, it, you are in the middle of the woods, in the mountains. It is not easy to get to. It was just, it was the, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, the single hardest thing I've done. Like, the hardest. And I'll send you a picture after. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll text it to you of my girlfriend's face, what it looks like if you have any moisture on your face at negative 30. So it's like you have, to, there's a lot of like terms and I can't explain everything, but comfortably cool. You can't start sweating. If it's that cold and you start sweating because you bundled up, oh, no. her eyelashes, her eyebrows, and, you know, any facial hair that, you know, little like, you know, the fuzzies Fuzz, that people yeah. have on their face. Froze. It was froze. It looked, her face had, it looked like a snowflake. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, her eyelashes had like layers of ice growing off of them. Yeah, so That's it's insane. dangerous out there. Like for all right, so I I think when I say the like negative thirty, I think people don't really understand that. Like if I told you it's thirty, like thirty degrees outside, you'd be like, wow, that's that's kind of cold, right? Yeah. Okay, so thirty degrees is kind of cold. Now, is ninety degrees is pretty hot, right? Yeah. Okay, the difference <laughs> between thirty and ninety is the same as 30 and negative 30. So when you wipe your nose on your sleeve, on your coat, it's instantly frozen. It's hard. Yeah. You can't take your gloves off to do anything. It, it's, 
it's it's fun because it's dangerous and hard though you know this is you with, with your crosshairs pointed at a mountain yes. right like yeah. this is i'm gonna see if i can do this here's yeah. here's my here's my hiking shelf you can see my gear here okay yeah so now these are my new boots here so this is all of my this is my snowshoes these around. are my packs i mean there's just endless gear you know it's like i have so much gear that i need more shelving you know but that's i mean that's i feel like a good problem to have you know <laughs> it could be worse. <laughs> now i know you I were know. like counting the summits or you were yeah. like chasing a bunch of summits How, where are you at with all that Oh, uh, I got, I got, I have to ask my girlfriend. I think we're at four. I'm at 40 and there's 46 high peaks in that around X. So a high peak is technically is 4,000 feet. Okay. So anything about 4,000 feet. Um, and some people out in Colorado that maybe see this show, like, Oh my God, that's, that's, that's nothing. We have 14,000 footers. Yeah, I know. It's about the gain. It's not about the it's elevation gain. So if you start at a thousand feet and you end up at 5,000 feet in I don't know, 10 miles, you gained 3,500 feet in 14 miles. That's hard. We have some of the most rugged terrain in the Adirondacks. And the challenge is the 46 high peaks, which are all above 4,000 feet in the Adirondacks. Um, I believe I'm at 40 right now. She's at 37 because she took a day off after um, after my fight last last uh whatever about a year ago my fight yeah uh we went up there for eight days and she had to take a day off so she missed three that i have so, <laughs> all right yeah all right um i guess speaking to the fighting segueing there uh man i love seeing you fight I, I you're highly entertaining anything anything on the horizon or where are we at i know you haven't had a whole lot of fights lately just very frustrated lately i mean I, i'm sure you've seen uh some of the stuff that I posted in the past couple months about uh, I've called out Tony Ferguson. I called out Mike Chandler. I called, I asked for RDA uh, and the only, they all say no, they turn it down every time. And it's like that, that with the, the really frustrating part was like, dude, Tony, I called you out. We both fought like one week apart last year. We both been available for a year now. It's like, dude, we've both been the only guys in the top 10 that didn't have fights. They offered us to fight three or four times. I literally would have signed it that day. Uh, and he just kept saying no. So then, I mean, I indirectly called out Chandler and Tony again a couple of times on Instagram. Uh, I posted, I don't know if you saw like a, a video of me shooting double legs like a million miles an hour. And um, I had my buddy Nick DiNatale, he's like superimposed over the video, the picture of the bracket where I like shit stopped Chandler at the Nationals in 09 when I beat him like 10 to 2. And then I put a picture up that's on like a full size poster of me like on top of Mike Chandler with a bar tilted sitting on my mom's piano at home. I'm just trying to like do, and I don't like talking shit, man. I'm like such a good, humble guy. And like, I do not want to talk shit, but it's like, I don't know what else I need to do to get these guys to accept the fight. Then a couple of weeks, I guess it'd be a month now, that guy Islam Makachev, his guy pulled out of the fight. So they offered me that fight on eight days notice. And I was like, absolutely not. And then a week later, they offered me RDA on five days notice. And this is not the UFC's fault. I want to be very clear about this. The UFC is the fucking best company in the world, but they can't force anyone to fight. And they can't force me to fight someone that I'm not interested in fighting that's not in the top, that's not ranked ahead of me. But at the end of the day, like, I'm 35 years old. I got a couple of years of this left. It's, I'm not doing this forever. If I'm not making a run towards the belt in the next year, then what am I doing here? I'm not going to, I'm not going to, my body is not going to start feeling better. You know what I mean? I'm not going to get more explosive and faster in the next two years. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's just a frustrating situation. And then like the RDA fight when they offered it to me on four days notice and like the UFC has to do that. They're trying to find a guy to replace someone last second. It's not the UFC. Then this obviously RDA would have taken that fight, but I said no for four days. No, I'm not fighting someone. They offered it to me on Monday. That means I would have had to fly out the next day. Like I'm not doing that. And then when he fought, I asked for him after and he said no. So like, okay, and it's just super frustrating you know but i'll yeah. tell you right now it's like i gotta fight someone that's getting me closer to the belt i'm 35 years old you know i don't want to do this forever 
Uh, I obviously started this fighting journey with one thing in mind, and it's like I, I'm fucking 14 and one. I have 12 finishes. Half of my fights in the UFC are bonus fights. Like, what do you want? You know, like you got me to have more followers. Is that what it is? I think that must be a part of it. You know, like just I don't get it. Do you ever? Do you ever? think that like you do need to shit talk or you do need to have antics i did that and they just fucking ignored me it's like i literally embarrassed mike chandler i put up a picture of the bracket and a picture like a poster size fucking picture of me like tilting him at the nationals and i posted the score where i be like yeah I don't know. I, I, so, no, I don't think I need to do more of that because everyone just ignored me. There was crickets from them. Like, you know, no, this is super funny, too. You know what I love is when people, like, after I called out Tony Ferguson and they're like, stop fucking picking on Tony. He's old. What, are you calling him out now when he's old? I'm like, dude, he's a fucking year older than me, man. Like, what are you talking about, man? Like, I'm old, too. You know, like, but... Yeah, so that's where we're at. I mean, ideally, right now, I, I would hope that maybe I get the fight with Benil Dariush. I really like that fight. Um, but otherwise, we wait. So. All right. Well, I'll anxiously wait because I, as much you know, like watching you wrestle. I like watching you fight, and I think you're entertaining. Yeah. Like you said, the, the the bonus, the bonuses, bonus rates, or um, not bo- <laughs> not bonus in wrestling, right? Bonus m- win money. Yeah. Um, uh, no, and I will say that you always do. You're, you're a man of your word. You do text me after every fight. You do. I got you. Yep. Um, okay, and wrestling. Uh, like, you know, how much do you keep up with the wrestling? Did you follow the NCAA season? Does anything excite you about the upcoming freestyle and Greco season? Okay, so this is, might be an unpopular opinion, and I hope <laughs> I'm not rubbing anyone the wrong way here, but I had a real issue this year, um, and I, I wasn't – vocal about it as in like yelling about it on like social media but i wasn't quiet about it i talked to yanni's dad on the phone for about fucking three hours the week after the nationals about this i spoke to yanni a little bit i talked to coach flynn you know the people that i'm involved with still in the wrestling community and i i kind of like voiced my grievances um my brother i I spoke with him about the same thing but dude what the fuck is happening where there's guys getting like their eighth try like i don't get that why is someone 28 years old man like dude what are you doing? The reason that it's so special when you place four times or you win or you win more than once is because it's so time sensitive. If you don't get the job done within four years, sorry, man, that hurts, right? It stings, which means when someone does do that, it's so special. If you get unlimited tries, it's like, well, man, it definitely takes something away from it. And I'll I'll tell you when, and I didn't like publicly boycott the NCAAs, you know, this is not what I'm saying, but I, I, I I said something to my brother this year, the first day of the nationals. I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not watching this year. I can't take this shit, man. It's so fucking annoying. Like this is, it bothers me seeing all these guys just get extra unlimited tries. I'm like, I'm not watching. And then when all those old guys started losing in the first day, I'm like, I'm back in. I'll watch. You know, and like I think Mary and Ali lost, and Mitchich and Airman, Ironman, and those guys lost. And I don't. I respect those guys. They are fucking so good at wrestling. Move on with your life. You know what I mean? Like, go get a job. Go fight. Go coach. You don't get unlimited tries just because you didn't do as good as you wanted to. Man, if that were the case, I would have gone and tried to win another one too. Man, like you just don't get to, and that's why it, it either hurts really fucking bad or it feels so good when you do win because of the time sensitivity. Sorry, this gets me a little fired up, but um, then, uh, so I, yeah, so that was, that's kind of the gist of it. It just seems like there, there's so many little weird loopholes now that are happening. It seems like they're giving out like obviously the COVID years and I, and this sounds so bad, but somebody has to get fucked. You know what I mean? Yeah. It sounds terrible, but you can't just keep doing this the cycle, right? So here's what happens. Okay, so the seniors who missed their uh, their 2020 year, right? All right, 
Well, shit, we give them that year back. Fine. That makes sense. Okay, cool. But then we give that whole next year, the 2021 year, we get that year that didn't count. Okay, so now this year, when think of how many young guys weren't on the podium this year because guys in their fifth and sixth years, okay, or seventh or eighth years. And then on top of that, what if the guys that were on those teams weren't even in the lineups because that spot was being occupied by a guy that was in his eighth year so right so you remedied the problem those guys who missed the covid year they got their problem solved but what about these guys are you going to give these guys an extra year now too because they lost their spot because of a guy that got an extra year of covid the merry-go-round has to stop and someone just has to get fucked sorry that's you know yeah but again it just like so many little weird things now that that it kind of like tweak the eligibility it seems like so for one it looks like they're giving medical red shirts out to anyone who you know bruises their kneecap um it appears that you can get an olympic red shirt if you just say you're wrestling freestyle uh i I don't know it just i guess when i saw like the big tens this year i I turned it on it just so happened to me marianelli they were talking about how he was uh the first four-time Big Ten champ from Iowa in two decades. But you forgot to mention that he tried – he got to wrestle in it six times. You know what I mean? Like – or five or whatever. You got an extra – okay. But it it takes something away from it when it's – you know, I sound like I'm a hater right now, but I'm not. I really, really respect these guys. And I think Marianelli's as tough as they come. And I think Ironman, he might be the guy, the sole guy to have beaten Yanni. I think he's incredible. Yeah. Listen, but don't you want to move on with life? Like, I remember at the end of my four, and I didn't even redshirt. It was the end of my four years. And I remember, I've said this to you, Mark. Yeah. My sentence was served. I did my time. It was too fucking. I mean, that was hard, man. Yeah. Like, I think it's time for a break. Don't you want to? Like, I don't know. And like, people would say, well, you fucking fight now, man. It's not the same. I'm not making weight twice a week. I'm not hopping on a bus or a plane and flying to a different fucking state every week. You know, it's, and I'm not trying to do schoolwork in between 630 lift and in 330 practice while I'm cutting weight, it's not the same, you know, it's just, that's it. I don't know. I guess that's me going off on a rant now about why guys are getting too many years. I sorry. I like your rant. And I don't know, this may send you on another rant. It may not. I, but do you have any opinions on NIL name image? Like that was coming. I literally knew that was coming. Uh, I think it's a double edged sword. So do I think, Wrestlers should be compensated for the work. Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, it changes the sport, doesn't it? So now, wrestling, why did we all wrestle up until the NIL? Well, shit, it wasn't because we were getting rich off of it, right? It certainly wasn't that. So it must have been for pure love. So I guess you would have to say that it changes the purity of the sport, right? It changes the integrity. It's going to make people act differently. And is uh, listen, I, I'm not hating on the guy. I fucking follow him on Instagram. AJ Ferrari is an entertaining guy, but would he still be doing those same shenanigans and antics if he wasn't going to get a sponsorship from Barstool Sports or the Nelk Boy or whatever? You know what I mean? Like people are acting that way because it's incentivized. So I don't know, you know, is this is this going to turn into uh, the WWE a bit like when Connor came into the UFC, it started looking like that. You know, I have always really loved that whole and it's so like cliche, but watch an interview from I don't know, they still it's still something you see, like watch any of those Penn State guys get interviewed after after they win a national title. It's that college Midwestern, you know, (laughs) Just a good, wholehearted American boy interview. I worked real hard to get here. I want to thank my parents. I want, you know, that's like that good boy college like interview. That's not going to be what it looks like moving forward. If the NIL thing, you know, starts handing out, you know, like the big people start handing out money. And then the other thing too, and like again, do not want to like name call and sound like I'm hating. I think. Roma and Bravo Young is one of the best guys to ever do it. But I I don't know if this is 
hearsay. Maybe you guys can tell me a little bit more about this, but I, I heard he was asking for like $160,000 from alumni to come back next year. I mean, okay. So then what? Let's say that happens. What's Yanni worth? Can't Yanni be like, well, I'm not wrestling then if Cornell alumni doesn't give me 180 grand because I've won three. And then what if Starachi comes in and he says, well, I, what, what, what the hell, man? I've I got three more tries so I could win five. So I need 200 grand. It, it, that's a slippery, slippery slope, you know? So, I mean... Have you guys heard anything about that Roman Bravo Young thing? Or is that a rumor or is that something that actually? I haven't heard that, though. I've heard those types of things just in general. Yeah. Um, well, how let me much clarify, truth there I is hope I'm not tenure. starting a bad rumor. I don't want to like start a bad rumor here, but I got a tweet from someone that it was a wrestling tweet and it was saying how Roman Bravo Young is asking for that amount of money. And, you know, I apologize if that isn't incorrect information, but I can't imagine that someone isn't doing that. So even if it, you know, someone's doing that. Well, there, know, there are, there are. They're called, What's that? they're called collectives. And I've just, I, I have a tiny understanding of this, but it basically these school, not the schools themselves, but the, these groups of alumni are creating organizations. I guess organization is the right word called, and they're collectives. So it's, um, okay. these group of alumni come together and pull their money together and they can now strike NIL deals with with the athletes and it's legal and for exactly what and what the the terms are i don't know i just know the general concept that and, and it's it's pretty public you know i think you can look this up and there's some guys on our full wrestling team who have dug deeper into this and they probably put, put articles out about it but i hear yeah. them when they're researching it they're like oh this school has a collective has state has a collective and i was like does missouri they're like yeah and, and i mean on and on iowa and you know I'll, 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 i don't even know there's a big number slippery, of schools that slippery are slippery slope because yeah. then, and again, I, I, I don't want to sound like all those people that I named that were saying like, hey, I, you know, if he's worth this much, then I right. need this much. They, if that's something that's happening and you're worth money, don't be an idiot and like, you know, cut off your nose to spite your face. If you can make that money, then you, if, if Roman Rumble Young gets that money, Starachi should go ask for more. You know, and don't don't cut off your nose to spite your face. But I don't think it should be happening in the first place. Um Again, maybe I sound like one of those guys that I used to be. Ah, he's just an old timer. What does he know? He's not with the times anymore. But, man, I, I just think it changes the purity and, and, and the integrity of the sport, man. You always watch it, and you know these guys. When you go to that NCAA tournament, and you're sitting in the stands, and you're looking down on those eight mats, and you're saying, dude, those guys are fucking all taped up and they're you know crying if they lose and jumping for joy when they win and you know like there is no incentive behind that besides the feelings that you get you know so and there's something special about that the, knowing that these guys suffer so much for a feeling not for <laughs> any money you know what i mean like isn't that crazy that's a that that's a great way to put it and i think that's why no, I don't know that this will, and who knows, 10 years down the road, maybe this is, maybe it will change it, the, the tournament. But that's what, what you described is why going to that tournament is so awesome. Because For you sure. see what these, what, what you, okay, what you, Gregor, are willing to put yourself through in a cage for a bag of money is one thing. And, I, and the feeling goes along with it, right? It feels good to win, I'm sure. And you want the belt. I wouldn't do you, it for free. Right, right. But you wrestled, which is, I've heard a lot of people say, maybe you too, that it's actually tough. You just said it, right? NCAA is tougher. School way tougher. classes, wait to, once, twice a week. Um, but to, to to see what, what happens at the NCAA tournaments, amazing. Yeah, um, and then if, I mean, it changes something about how you view the guys, right? So if I go watch and I know that, hey, you know, so-and-so has a side deal with some rich alumni if they win and then you see them win and you see them celebrating, you know that it's from a bag. You know, it's not for, man, I did something that I really set out to do from a young age and the feeling of winning and knowing that I was the best and making my mom and dad and my family and everyone that's been behind me proud was enough. That, that changes something for the athlete and it certainly changes something from the spectator standpoint. So I don't, I, but is yeah, it's, I don't even know if there's immediate level. Is I don't, there a middle ground. Maybe, I don't know yeah. if it's good or bad. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's yeah. good that they are able to get paid, and and 
it's definitely good that they're able to get paid. But I see your point of of changing the, the dynamic of the intent yep. or motivation. Yeah. Well, again, like I guess, what's more important then is it that I am satisfied as a spectator, or that the guy actually doing the work is getting compensated for? You know, who knows, right? It, we could go on for days, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, you could. But uh, I'll tell you what, I was uh, after I tuned in, I started watching uh, day two of the Nationals this year, and I, I'm really fucking glad I did, man. It was. Uh, it was exciting. It was really cool. And obviously last year was not the same with the no, the, no people in the stands and the Ivy leagues, not there. It didn't feel like a national tournament. And like the guys still beat good guys, you know, but watching that finals is like, well, there's no one there. Like, yeah. what is this? You know? So yeah, that was exciting. And I'm glad that, uh, that I was able to bring myself to, to watch. And obviously circumstances permitting those older guys lost early on in the tournament. And I was like, ah, fuck, I'm back in. <laughs> so yeah awesome um just last thing i know you know you, you went through this in the film right you won as a sophomore you're like oh, the goal is now i'm supposed to win three right and and coming out of your senior year with four all americans just one title how did you feel about your career and has that changed at all as you look back and and reflect oh man that's that's i i think my answer to that changes with time you know mm -hmm. it's like First, well, let me start by saying, do you think I could apply for an Olympic redshirt and maybe get another try at this? Dude, I mean, everyone else is getting fifth and sixth years. Can I come back? You can, all, nah. you can apply. No, yeah, I'm sure I, you can apply. I mean, I could certainly I, – I was hurt one of those years. Didn't you see the tape on my leg? I did. Fuck, I did. the year that I won. That's not going to work. Uh, so, no, anyways, yeah, I, I think that answer changes with time. And I think – I think had I won – three titles who knows i probably wouldn't be competing still i think that and i don't know if that's even the right thing to say i, I would say had i done everything right because i do things right now i eat right i train three times a day six days a week i don't drink i don't do drugs i go to bed most of the time at a reasonable hour it's you know I, I, my main focus is that thing so i guess it's still, I'm like in an experiment. How good can I be? That's kind of why I'm still competing. Had I done all those things right in college and won three titles, who knows, man? I, I probably wouldn't be doing this. I probably wouldn't be competing. I know, I know how good I can be. I did it. I won three of them. How much better could you get, right? But, I mean, it, you know, I think it all happens the way it's supposed to happen. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe those uh, unfortunate things that I uh, put myself through in the college years, um, uh, cost me a little bit then and you know meaning a, a national title or two and maybe that's why i'm at where i am now so well i mean it, it seems like you're at a good place to me and i don't know it's, it's this cliche right but everything happens for a reason if you want to look at it that way right you you're, you're i think it does and yourself. the timing is you no know, it's it happens when it's supposed to happen you know so yeah awesome Man, we're coming up. We're coming up on an hour, and it feels like we we just started. But um, we are winding down. We got Kyle Klingman joining us here. He's got um, a little game we like to play with our guests, and uh, he's going to try to beat you on some answer, on some questions here. Hey, thanks, Mark. It's our game called Sweat It Off. I could just point this out. I, this is your three hundredth episode. We started with John DeJulius on Monday, and we end with this. Listening to both, it was like identical interviews, identical energy. Kind of the difference was Johnny DeJulius said that he kind of had the foresight not to get into alcohol early on and, and has never drank. So you guys are both in a situation where you don't drink now, but I don't know what Mark thinks, but it felt like identical interviews, identical energy. They go for the the thrill, uh, just different outlets. So it felt the same, and I've never experienced a, a kind of interview at the, the beginning of the week and end of the week like this. <laughs> Awesome. I'm a huge fan of his, by the way, man. I follow his Instagram, dude. What a big set of balls that dude's got. And I watched, obviously, I saw that episode, and he's like, it's not the absence of fear. He's like, if a, a courageous person is someone who is scared and pushes through it, man. I, I loved that, man. And I like going up on top of the mountains. I just don't like jumping off of them. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the difference between me and him. But what a cool motherfucker that guy is, man. Uh, you, you guys met on the energy. Have you guys What's met that? before? Have you guys oh, met before? Oh God! I mean, I'm sure we've crossed paths in our in our wrestling days. I I I'm just 
positive we've said hi and you know hung out with the same people but i no, like post college, definitely not. No, but I mean, I've spoken with them on uh, on Instagram through direct message a couple times, telling them how fucking cool his life is and how the, the my favorite video of this is the one where he's hanging out of the hot air balloon. He's like, look, he's like, don't let me go, Johnny, don't let me go, no, I'm letting go, and he lets go, and it's filmed from in the hot air balloon, and he's falling down away from it. It's just the coolest video, man. Like, I I love that dude. I'd love to get you two guys together, dude. <laughs> Arrange it. We'll, we'll set, set it up. I think it'd be awesome. Yeah, Good call, Kyle. That's a flow film right there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> our our sweat it out. Number one, Tim Flynn wrestled for Penn State and qualified for nationals three times. What was his best finish at nationals? Seventh. He got it. Seventh in nineteen eighty seven. Number two, what town was awarded the title of number one sports town in New York on May fifteenth, two thousand five? God, oh my God, I know this. Hilton, no, I don't know. What is it? Webster. Webster, that's where I'm from. Is that a joke? <laughs> How did I not know that? <laughs> 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 what year, hold on, what year was that awarded that? <laughs> 2005. Dude, 2005. are you kidding me? That's the year I graduated. It's because of me. <laughs> you're i think you're messing with me right this, this oh, is the whole point. seriously I'm oh dude i'm literally br- blushing i'm so embarrassed i didn't know that <laughs> you made him sweat it's right. called sweat it out i'm Hell literally yeah. sweating from that all right next we gotta get away from right. that question number three who was the first ncaa d1 champion in edinburgh history uh sean o'day yep sean o'day did in featured in another flow film about edinburgh yeah in uh, oh, yeah, in the program yeah. Yep, yep, nailed it. Number four, true or false, trout are classified as oily fish. Ooh, no, they're salmonoids. No, false. That's uh, actually true. They're oily fish. <gasps> oh, wow, look at that. I lost a fish. See, I told you I've been away from fishing. <laughs> you didn't know he was into climbing. In other words, you'd have some climbing yeah. questions. I saw, I saw your Patagonia hat on, by the way, with the salmon on it. That's a nice hat. Oh, yeah, thanks. Appreciate <laughs> it. And then number five, what is the best flow film of all time? Oh man, um, well I would have to be, you know, obviously I'm biased, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say, you know, fight of your life. But I I, I went on. Uh, man, there's so many. That's such an unfair question. I, I love the Colat ones. Those are like, yeah, you know, the yeah. the the brands one. Um, Matt Calf was another fucking. That was like. Oh man, that one tugged at the heartstrings. Uh, obviously, the program was incredible, and I went on a long, like rabbit hole binge watching after uh, uh, after the the fight of your life. I watched that, and then I just kept clicking and clicking. And um, I, I I love the one that I'm in, obviously, but I, I feel like that should be excluded from me picking just because of the obvious inherent bias. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the Colat the Colat series, yeah. Go ahead and say, we'll say, yeah, it's a good one. Very good one. Yeah. You sweat it out. Nice work. That's it. That's, was that four out of five? five, Yeah. All right. Only when I get, wait. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I got the Webster (laughs) one. (laughs) Oh man. That's all right. Uh, Gregor, this, this has been a freaking blast, man. You're, you're, you're a trip. You're, you're bottle energy. Thanks guys. Yeah. Yeah. You're really, really fun to talk with. Um, we're going to give you the final word. You know, we've gone through a myriad of topics, but anything you want to say about anything, a plug, a hi, a shout out, a joke. Oh, I mean, I, I, well, I guess it would feel appropriate that I thank all the people who helped me when I needed them. And, uh, you know, back in those trying times and my early twenties when I was getting through something pretty tough, uh, man, I, I, I think that the message from that, film i think this would probably be the appropriate way to end this would be a message about that film or the message i hope people receive from that film is that you can you can have a, a really fucking great life if if you can just get through something that you're getting through right now and it may seem fucking impossible and it may seem like a, the biggest fucking mountain that you have to overcome and you know climb up the you could do it and there's plenty of fucking people who've done the same thing you have. You are not alone. And it is not something that someone else hasn't been through and probably worse. 
You know, if you feel like, oh man, well, that's different. My situation's, no, it's not. Every single drug addiction story is extremely similar. So there are a ton of people, tons of resources. And uh, I mean, there's, I hope the message from that video is that there's a fucking fantastic life waiting for you. And I think that, you know, the hardest part is just getting through those first couple of days. And when you start to feel normal again and you make, man, what was I doing? Man, I was trapped in a merry-go-round that kept spinning. And I just couldn't get off of it. And once you get off, you're happy you did. So, um, and I, I think, and I, I'll leave it at this. Uh, one of the messages or comments, I'm sorry, that I saw on that, on, on the, on the film, uh, I don't recall if it was on your guys's flow account on Instagram or if it was on mine, but it was someone said these exact words, the most important piece flow has ever done. And I don't want that to sound selfish because it could have been anyone that's had, you know, a similar story. It was the premise of the film. It was the message of the film. It was the way you guys, uh, the, the way you 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 put it out there, the way that you edited it all together, it was just so important. I couldn't agree more than what that. I don't know who the person was, obviously, but it was the most important piece Flo has ever done. And it sounds crazy, but probably saved a life or two with that one, you know. So I've had hundreds of messages coming in on Instagram, you know whether it was someone who had a family member, whether it was someone saying that they were struggling and this is helping them, whether it's someone who had struggled in the past and said, wow, I had no idea. You know, thank you for being so open about that stuff. So who knows if that was the best flow film. It was certainly a great one, but I, I, I agree with it being the most important one. That's for damn sure. Awesome. Gregor Gillespie. <laughs> What a joy. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Um, we'll have you on again. We'll, we'll track down Johnny DeJulius. We'll get you to Dude, Make it happen. That'll make my day. I will. Thanks so much, man. All I appreciate right. it. Thanks, guys. I really yeah. appreciate everything you guys do. Absolutely. Have a great day. All right. Yeah, bye. Kyle, wow. I I feel pumped up. I want to I wanna just, like, sprint through the day. This guy's, this guy's out of control in, in a good way. Just energy is out of control. It's insane. You're right. Like, I'm just... <laughs> I just feel different. I feel like I'm kind of on cloud nine right now. And so you get that, uh, you get that vibe from him. It was, uh, I mean, my jaw just drops hearing him talk about this and you just keep saying, just keep going, dude. I don't want you to stop. So no, it was awesome. no. my, my head's spinning wound up. Um, we finished the week on that. He, he, I really wanted to have Gregor on and episode 300 seemed appropriate. Um, so we did a Friday show. So that's it. Hope you all have a great weekend. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. For Kyle Klingman and Gregor Gillespie, I'm Mark Bader. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week. Adios.